Good morning and welcome to FPRI's first Google Hangout. Uh, I'm Michael Noonan, Director of Research at the Foreign Policy Research Institute. Uh, my apologies that last week's event uh, didn't go on as expected because of some technical difficulties and a snow day and uh, everybody in the office being distributed kind of hampered things. But I'm delighted today to have a very fine panel with us. Uh, I will introduce them and then go uh, give a brief discussion of the Greenwood article, and then we'll get into a lively uh, Q&A session. And if you're watching this from the Google Plus page, you can actually pose questions that hopefully we can get to at the end. If you're watching it through YouTube or through the FPRI page, I don't believe you're going to be able to post questions, uh, but uh, thank you for joining us today. So as I said, we have a, a great panel with us. First, we have uh, Dr. Will McCants. He's a fellow in the Center for Middle East Policy and director of its project on U.S. relations with the Islamic world at the Brookings Institution. He's also an adjunct faculty at Johns Hopkins University. From 2009 to 2011, he was a State Department senior advisor for countering violent extremism. And uh, he's the founder of Jihadica.com, an academic group uh, blog focused on the global jihadi movement. He's published in Foreign Affairs, among other uh, places. Editor of Militant Ideology Atlas, which identified the key ideologues in the global jihadi movement. He's also author of Founding Gods, Inventing Nations, Conquest and Culture Myths from Antiquity to Islam, which traces the history of cultural debate in the Middle East after the Greeks, Romans, and Arabs conquered the region. And currently, he's at work on a second book about a scriptural history of the Quran. Uh, now, last but certainly not least, he has a PhD in Near East Studies from Princeton University and has lived in Israel, Egypt, and Lebanon. He's also Morgan Fairchild's favorite analyst of the <laughs> Middle East. Next, we have Trudy Rubin. She writes the Worldview column for the Philadelphia Inquirer, which runs on Thursdays and Sundays. Over the last decade, she has had multiple trips to Iraq, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Egypt, Turkey, Israel, and the West Bank, and has also written from Syria, Tunisia, Lebanon, Iran, Russia, Ukraine, South Korea, and China. She's the, awful, the author of Willful Blindness, the Bush Administration in Iraq. She's a 2001 finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Commentary. In 2008, she was awarded the Edward Weintel Prize for International Reporting. And in 2010, she received the Arthur Ross Award for International Commentary from the American Academy of American Diplomacy. And last but certainly not least, we have Clint Watts, who is a senior fellow of the Foreign Policy Research Institute. He blogs regularly at Geopoliticus and also at Selective Wisdom and War on the Rocks and other places. He's the president of Mybro Solutions, Inc., He's written for Foreign Affairs, War on the Rock, Small Wars Journal. He's also the editor of Selected Wisdom. He's a former U.S. Army infantry officer, an FBI, a former FBI special agent and a joint terrorist, a joint terrorism task force. He was the executive officer of the Combating Terrorism Center at West Point CTC. So thank you all for joining me today. And as we said, we're going to be talking about uh, the Graham Wood piece about what ISIS uh, really wants. We'll also be talking uh, about combating or countering or uh, combating violent extremism, foreign fighters, and also we'll try to get in some, some stuff about Al Qaeda as well. So the Graham Wood piece obviously has created a lot of debate. Uh, the last time I checked, it had over 9,300 comments on the Atlantic page, <laughs> uh, which is quite a lot. I think they've actually even had somebody from ISIS write a response to it. <laughs> and, and, articles. Um, and it's a very controversial piece. Uh, he kind of makes two, uh, two big arguments. One, he says that we misunderstand the nature of the Islamic State in at least two ways. First, uh, we tend to look at jihad as, uh, jihadism as monolithic and apply the logic of al-Qaeda uh, to another organization, ISIS, which is not similar. It's kind of like one of these things is not like the other from Sesame Street. Um, and uh, there's also issues about uh, bin Laden viewed his, his terrorism as a prologue to the caliphate, but he did not expect to see it in his lifetime, whereas the Islamic State uh, obviously see it that the Khalifa has returned. 
Two, uh, Graham uh, Woods argues that we are misled in a second way um, in that we are denying that there is actually, by people saying that the Islamic State is not Islamic, this is uh, one of the controversial arguments, he says no, it actually is, it's just kind of a medieval, uh, medieval religious nature. I think uh, Will can get into that a bit uh, more. Um, he says that the reality is the, the Islamic State is Islamic, very Islamic, yet it has attracted psychopaths and adventurer seekers drawn largely from the disaffected populations of the Middle East and Europe, but the religion preached by its most ardent followers derives from coherent and even learned interpretations of Islam. Obviously very controversial. Uh, another point uh, he talks about is uh, the issue of takfir and uh, excommunication. Um, and he brings up the point that uh, if a man says to his brother, you are an infidel, the prophet said, uh, then one, one of them is right. If the accuser is wrong, he himself has committed apostasy uh, by making a false accusation, and the, the, uh, the punishment for apostasy is death. Um, and he traces this back really to Zarqawi and Al-Qaeda in Iraq and the Islamic State in Iraq, uh, where uh, Zarqawi really tried to pour gasoline on the fire of the insurgency by going after the Shia, which then has led to uh, many of the, uh, the issues today. Um, two other points. One, he talks about uh, this millenarian element of the Islamic State, talking about Dabiq as this kind of uh, central location where, where Muslims will defeat the Romans, quote-unquote. Uh, so one of the issues I want to talk about to Will about is if you have a scriptural literalist tradition, um, trying to define Romans as somebody other than the Romans seems to me is kind of a parable or some kind of innovation, which kind of gets into kind of a logical logical circle or spiral there about that. But Will, Will knows the subject much better than, than myself. And finally, he talks about quietist, uh, quietist Salafism as kind of an antidote uh, to this. This is also controversial. Some people say that no, this can be kind of a gateway drug to kind of more militant uh, jihadism. Um, but uh, perhaps quietist Salafism is kind of more like ultra-Orthodox communities around where it's kind of much more devoted to prayer and other things and not really worried about politics or kind of local, local matters. Um, and I guess one last point before I turn it over to Will would be that, so this is, uh, you know, they've established this, this caliphate. Now we have other groups uh, springing up in other places as far as South Asia, uh, Libya, Boko Haram now has made a bayat to uh, join the Islamic State. Um, but in, in uh, Iraq and Syria, this is really tied to, uh, to geography. You can't be the, the caliph without the caliphate or without territory. Uh, so that might be another issue about denying that. Of course, one of the issues the United States has is that this, this caliphate, or whatever you want to call it, this Islamic State, quote-unquote, uh, straddles two borders. One where we had uh, supported the government in the past, and we're supporting them now in Iraq. And then another state in Syria... Uh, where we obviously have problems with the Assad regime, and uh, we, you know, we've conducted attacks there, uh, but there are different different areas, kind of different um, uh, different matters at hand. So, Will, uh, why don't we start off with you? You can talk a little bit about the Graham Wood piece, and then uh, we can go from there. Sure. Um, on the question of how much ISIS differs from Al Qaeda, uh, I think it differs quite a bit, and you highlighted some of the some of the differences. But I can I can go through them quickly. Um, one is they're not very much into the hearts and minds uh, campaign that Al Qaeda tries to wage uh, among uh, Sunni populations. You know the the usual Al Qaeda approach, at least theoretically, is to try and win over broad mass support for their revolutions. Uh, Zawahiri in particular believes that that's key to success. You can see that Nusra operates uh, in that manner. Um, the Islamic State is very different. It's, it's really in its DNA going back to Zarqawi uh, that um, it doesn't see uh, popular support uh, as essential uh, for achieving their political goals. Quite the opposite. 
Uh, it believes it only needs a narrow amount of support, enough to attract uh, a sufficient number of recruits, and that uh, brutal tactics uh, will be enough to gain territory and to control the population uh, that they rule over. Um, so brutality is very much a hallmark of the Islamic State. It's not to say Al-Qaeda isn't brutal, but this is on a spectrum, and I think, I think most observers would concede that this group has gone beyond um, uh, uh, what uh, Al-Qaeda's leaders uh, would, have, uh, would have sanctioned. Uh, in terms of, of brutality. So that's a major difference uh, over hearts and minds. Um, another difference is over whether to establish the caliphate now or in the future. Um, as, uh, as Cole Bunzel argues in a recent paper that Brookings put out this week, um, uh, you can see that the idea for setting up an Islamic state that would become a caliphate actually came about as a, in consultation between some al-Qaeda members and Zarqawi, but those Al-Qaeda members envisioned it happening in the future, uh, that it would come about, um, uh, again, through mass support for its establishment, that it wouldn't be done by fiat. Um, the Islamic State differs. Uh, its declaration of a state back in 2006 uh, wasn't done without much consultation. Its decision to shift to a caliphate wasn't done without much consultation. Uh, they're much more focused on creating um, uh, uh, a caliphate in fact on the ground and not waiting for it to come about magically uh, in the future. Um, I think the third way that it's distinguished from Al-Qaeda is its apocalypticism, which is what I'm writing about uh, in my book, The ISIS Apocalypse. Um, uh, you know, most jihadist groups, Sunni jihadist groups, have what I would call a soft apocalypticism. Uh, they believe that you know, they're approaching uh, the end times um, they see themselves as soldiers in the in the vanguard fighting, but they're not sure when those end times will happen. Um, it could be a hundred years, could be a thousand years from now. Um, and Al Qaeda leaders didn't use a lot of apocalyptic language uh, uh, in their statements. If you contrast that with the Islamic State, uh, both the first Islamic State and now its successor state, um, uh, they use a lot of apocalyptic language. Uh, uh, particularly in their recruitment, and it has also driven some of their military decisions on the ground. That's not to say that other things don't factor into that decision making, but this is a, a, a chief component of their ideology and sets them apart um, uh, from Al Qaeda. Um, on the Islamic State's use of uh, use of scripture uh, and uh, the medieval Islamic tradition. Um, I guess where I would differ where, with Graham's characterization is it, I, I don't know that you would call it uh, the Islamic State med medieval because it's specifically the medieval period that they ignore. The medieval period in Islam is a period of intense debate between scholars uh, over what to make of scripture. And just like the Jewish rabbinical tradition, they developed a very elaborate uh, corpus of material for thinking through the contradictions in scripture and trying to come up with some coherent rules governing uh, human behavior. Because the Islamic State are Salafis, um, they believe that you should go back to Scripture itself, and you don't need to pay so much attention to the medieval tradition, that you need to go right back to the Quran and to statements and actions attributed to Muhammad, and you can come up with your own rulings. Um, and so their approach to Scripture then um, uh, is, uh, is very much part of this puritanical, uh, Protestant-like impulse um, in, uh, in modern Islam um, that has much more of a connection with the sort of Islam you would find in Saudi Arabia uh, than, than anywhere else. Um, their willingness to pick and choose among the prophet's statements um, uh, and supposed actions uh, to justify uh, uh, their own uh, violent actions um, isn't just a, a matter of, um, of uh, cynical use of scripture or cherry picking, as, as, as people call it, uh, but it's also part and parcel of the, of, the, uh, of the Salafi method of dealing with text that you can go through and, and, come, to, and come to your own rulings and not be bound uh, by the uh, medieval strictures on, uh, on violent actions. So, for example, uh, with the burning of the pilot, there are statements from the prophet, many statements from the prophet, that say that you cannot burn 
Uh, you cannot burn your enemies. You cannot burn apostates. Uh, but there's a few statements from the prophet that, that suggest he might have tolerated under circum certain stances. And those, of course, are the ones that, the, that ISIS has picked up on. And I sort of see their interpretive method um, as maximum latitude for maximum violence. And they believe that whatever scriptures um, might serve as a um, restriction on certain violent actions they want to undertake, um, those scriptures can be overridden uh, by others uh, um, that fit more in line with their worldview or uh, that um, uh, deterrence uh, or tit-for-tat allows them uh, to override those scriptures. Now, you, you, could, you could characterize that um, as a, 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 cynical, a cynical use of, of Scripture, but I, but I think there's more at play, and it has a lot more to do with the, with the Salafi uh, method of, of dealing with texts um, and much less to do with the medieval tradition of uh, Islamic jurisprudence. Thank you, Will. Trudy? Well, um, you know, in a way, we're having this conversation because Graham Wood's article sparked so much attention, and the reason it sparked so much attention is because there's such a debate in this country over whether uh, this is a war against Islam, a war against a violent uh, a subset of Islamist um, uh, militants, or uh, whether, as President Obama and the administration have insisted, we should be censoring language and talk about combating violent extremism, as was the case in the conference recently held at the White House. Um, and in a way, I don't feel that Graham Wood's piece really contributed too much to the important aspects of that debate. I mean, it was it was very interesting in looking at the ideology um, uh, of the core ideologues in in uh, the ISIS movement. But the big questions, it seems to me, are uh, how much does Islam figure in recruitment uh, for fighters, uh, in the, especially foreign fighters? This is certainly what interests us in the United States the most. And how much does doctrine, or Islamic doctrine, what Graham Wood writes about, figure in telling us how to fight against ISIS. And he doesn't speak very much about that. I mean, after going through all of his um, detail about doctrine, what he comes down to in the end is that because of political complications, the only thing that could be done by those who oppose ISIS is to bleed it, uh, basically to contain it, and that's because of political complications. And then he talks about um, Salafist quietism as an alternative, which I think is just plain silly. Uh, I mean, this uh, Salafist quietists probably reached the maximum extent of their power in Egypt when they got into politics, and now they're basically discredited there. And that kind of a movement is not going to attract uh, the kind of young people from France or Germany, let alone from Egypt, who might volunteer to fight with ISIS. So I think the whole question of is this uh, an Islam problem, a problem in Islam, Islamic extremism, really has to be uh, approached from a much bigger uh, perspective uh, than what Wood did. Um, and, and you know, I, I would say there are three aspects that you, you have to look at. I mean, first of all, you're looking at recruitment. How much uh, is recruitment, especially foreign recruits, due to this ideology? And how much is it due to other factors? Uh, and, and now, Clint has written more on that, and, and uh, you know, uh, Will McCants, you know, has a broader knowledge of this than I, but I would say that we know pretty much from looking at it that you have a lot of malcontents, um, unhappy, young, alienated Muslims in, in uh, uh, Europe, and we don't have a full sample survey, but there clearly are a lot of reasons that they are coming to join this movement that have more to do with social and psychological aspects of their lives than have to do with the actual doctrine or the apocalyptic 
aspect of the doctrine. And let me say here that I, I do dispute the administration's effort to keep the word Islamic out because I think Islam does figure in many of these aspects. Obviously, it's, it's disaffected young Muslims who are going to the region. And in the region, Islam figures prominently in how you fight back against this. Uh, but when it comes to Graham Wood's piece and the actual uh, ideology that Will McCants knows so much about, um, I, I don't think that gives you the answers. And I think that a lot of people who, took to, who turned to Wood's piece uh, you know, may have been looking for something they didn't find or may have been people who wanted to be able to say this is a war of civilizations. And I don't think that Graham Wood has, has uh, proved that. So, uh, you know, just a couple of other points. So I think you have to look at the role of Islam in recruitment and in trying to discourage those recruits. And then you have to look at the role of Islam in the politics of the region. I mean, <laughs> the main reason that ISIS was able to create a caliphate is because of the politics in Syria and the politics in Iraq. And obviously Islam is involved there because you have sectarian warfare, but you also have failed states. You have failed states throughout the region. And so uh, this is as much a political as an Islamic question. But in the region, there's a huge debate over the role of Islam in politics. And I think, uh, you know, many of us have come to the conclusion that only the states in the region can really fight back effectively against um, uh, ISIS. And a lot of that has to do with the this debate over the role of Islam in politics. And, and on this point, let me just say one other thing. I'm, I'm speaking too long, but I'll just mention this. Um, when you're debating on the role of Islam in, in uh, uh, creating and maintaining ISIS, one of the aspects that is being mentioned, but I think is being under-considered, is the role of Saudi Arabia. It has come to the fore. But the role of the propagation of Wahhabi or Salafist Islam which provides the underpinnings for the thinking that has gone into the making of ISIS's ideology. And some uh, experts want to downplay that because Saudi Arabia doesn't carry it to the next extreme. I, I think that uh, 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 Graham Wood himself said Wahhabis are not wanton in their violence. But having covered the Middle East for 35 years, uh, I, I cannot tell you how many times I have seen the consequence of Saudi funding of radical Islamic thinking in madrasas all over the Islamic world. Certainly it's a factor in Pakistan where they fund these schools which actually train jihadis. Uh, as so, uh, to me, one of the aspects of is this Islamic terrorism or radical Islamic terrorism that has to be dealt with is our Arab countries fueling, like Saudi Arabia especially, fueling radical Islamist thinking that may be one step before ISIS, but still figures into the mindset that helps create ISIS. And, you know, the last point in talking about the role of Islam in fighting ISIS, the caliphate. Uh, you know, Graham Wood points out that that's the exciting thing, the control of territory. So, you know, that's an aspect where doctrine and politics cross. Um, and, you know, I believe that the military piece of this is critical because if you break the caliphate, Fate, then the whole ideology of ISIS becomes useless and meaningless because what they have, apocalypticism is not unique to them, what they have is territory. And so Islam figures in that also. So I think when one is looking, you know, to describe the role of Islam in creating or in fighting ISIS, one has to be looking more at the ideology of, of the core group of ideologues in the movement. We know there are Baathists involved. We know that there are malcontents coming from abroad. It's a much bigger picture than Graham Wood presents. And, uh, you know, it, it intrigues me that his piece got so many hits because I think if people are looking for the answers, they don't find it in that piece. Well, thank you, Trudy. Clint. 
Uh, on the wood piece, I mean, I think uh, the way ISIS cherry picks the Quran, uh, Americans like cherry picking wood's piece. I mean, if you want to play out any side of your argument in the war on terror, you can find it in there. If you want to talk about how this these guys are, you know, lowly criminals and they sort of drift off and you know, join ISIS and it's not about religion, you can find it in there. If you want to talk about how religion is the cause behind all of this, you can find it in there. You know, I, I thought I thought the article was good. I mean, it was a good overview. Um, I thought it was, you know, an, an excellent piece on discussing the ideological components of it. What I found interesting in people's response to it is the, the heavy fixation on religion. Um, as sort of, you know, it's that 2003, 2004, we got to win the hearts and minds of the world and, you know, extinguish this ideology from the planet. And when we rewind just the last decade's history, we haven't been too successful at that, and nothing we've tried to do has worked. And no one really, like, comes to discuss that the reason this Sharia governance, this caliphate, has come up there is because two other forms of governance have failed. One... Uh, apostate dictators, you know, are no longer oppressing their people, and two, the wonderful, we're going to democratize the Middle East plan of, like, 2003 has failed. And so, you know, Iraq, where we deliberately put, you know, a decade of effort into is is not secure, and it is not stable. So people are fixating on no, Sharia governance. It's the evil of all all evils, and, and we need to focus on this, but it's there in, because nothing else has worked. You know, there is no other system that's worked. In terms of the recruits, too, what I thought was interesting from the Wood article, you know, I like the discussion of the Australian, you know, imam who's radicalizing online. And when you look at the recruits that are coming in, you know, you get this mixed batch. And so people like to say the ideology, Trudy, you know, referred to it, this ideology is so powerful it just takes over their minds and it's like mind control and they float to Syria or whatever. But really what you're looking at is those that are, you know, losers on the in the world of globalization. These are people that the world has not worked out for them. Uh, some of them it's psychological issues, some it's social, some it's familial, you know, like it's generations that uh, their families have been participating in jihad. And then there are some that's extremely ideologically devout. And so when you see them, you know, drift there, I, I don't think the Wood article you know, posed a good solution for that necessarily. You know, I didn't really offer that up. But you can fight the religion all you want. Those people will drift to other places, you know, will drift to other things. You can make a strong argument that we have all sorts of discontents and, and people that have lost their way across all of Latin America as well, but they choose to join criminal organizations that don't attack the white and the rich. Uh, they instead fight their own battles. So, you know, we have the same sort of dynamic, you know, that comes across in all sorts of ways uh, throughout the world. Um, in terms of, like, uh, you know, Will and, and Trudy really covered, you know, a lot of the ISIS stuff. Our, our big problem is I, the U.S. doesn't know what it wants to do in the Middle East, and we've got, we're allies with everybody in one way or another. We're allies with Saudi Arabia, who funds, I, you know, indirectly through the population funds or supports ISIS, supports the ideological backing of it, and sends the most number of foreign fighters, you know, into the fight. And if you look at Jan Berger's ISIS census that came out of Brookings, the number one place that shows up to this day for ISIS supporters on Twitter is Saudi Arabia. So we're sitting here using them as an ally. Uh, Saudi Arabia will do a lot of, you know, they've, they've partaken in the counterterrorism effort, but then they will turn right around and stick a finger in our eye uh, in terms of what they're what they're doing, you know, you look on the other side of the coin. You know, we've got the Assad regime in Iran, which America's pursuing some sort of backhanded strategy to get a nuke deal. Uh, I'm not sure entirely how that's all going to work, um, but when you do the calculations to a ISIS justifications, you know, we we get upset about beheadings, but Saudi Arabia has beheaded more people than ISIS this year. We get upset about ISIS atrocities, and yet we watch the Assad regime barrel bomb, you know, across lots of Syria and Iraq. So is it the ideology? Sure, but it's also the political dimensions. We're on the wrong side or partners with everybody, and in the end we're losing because we haven't really decided what we want for Syria and Iraq. And I think the most important thing that's come out this, this week politically, you know, no matter what we do with ISIS, and we will break them up, they will decline, and they'll shatter into pieces. 
but pool again in the next failed or semi-failed state, which might be Libya or a host of other places. But as we see, there is no governance solution right now in Iraq, and there is no governance solution in Syria. So we can point to religion, 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 and we can fight this for another decade, and we will. But until we come up with some sort of alternative, uh, there's nowhere really to go. Thanks, Clint. Uh, Will, do you want to respond to anything that either uh, Trudy or uh, Clint said? Yeah, sure. Um, I think uh, I think both Trudy and Clint are, are, are on point um, that there are a number of things that are driving the growth of ISIS, and it is not purely uh, their religious appeal. I think I think the reason that Graham wrote his article, though, um, is because uh, the the president uh, and others. Uh, have been very insistent that this organization has nothing whatsoever to do with religion. Um, and I think his piece is a reaction to that. Perhaps it's an, an overreaction, um, uh, but nevertheless, it's a, it's a reaction because uh, people don't want to acknowledge that in the minds of the ISIS organization and most of its followers, uh, they see themselves as uh, the true Muslims, uh, that are the most pious and the most observant of Scripture, and outsiders can uh, pick apart uh, their claims to represent Islam or, or to be pious, but nonetheless, that's how they think of themselves. Um, and I think Graham's, you know, Graham's piece was um, a reaction to this idea that's been going around, that this organization has nothing whatsoever to do with the religion, and I think, you know, if... if um, if that's the case, you would have a really hard time understanding its appeal. And sure, you could talk about uh, uh, political uh, breakdown in Iraq, which we caused, uh, the United States caused. Uh, you could talk about the social unrest uh, uh, and social marginalization or alienation that's driving young people to join. But if you don't come to grips with the organization's self-conception, um, uh, uh, you would have a hard time explaining why um, they did some of the things they did, uh, how they were able to attract so many, and why other Sunni rebels in the region have not articulated themselves the same way. I mean, not, this is not purely a function of violence, and it is not purely a function of politics. I think Trudy and Clint are saying the same thing. I think we're all saying that there are a variety of factors here um, I happen to focus more on the ideological element, but that also doesn't mean that I think the United States needs to tackle the ideological element. As, as Trudy hinted at, and also Clint, you know, the 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 core of the ISIS ideology um, is its claim to be an actual uh, uh, caliphate reborn, and for that you have to control territory and you have to rule justly over your subjects. And if, if you can show one or the other to be a lie, um, uh, either through conquest or their own ineptitude, uh, you will go a long way towards uh, delegitimizing uh, the organization. But, as Clint says, you know, because of the political dysfunction um, uh, in the region, you will continue to have people who will revive this idea, and that's part of the uh, the sad trajectory here is that now the Islamic State has shown that this idea has legs, and it's not just a pipe dream, and it's not something to be longed for uh, in the far future, but something that, that is actually attainable um, given the right political circumstances. I wanted to briefly return to a point that Trudy made about the apocalypticism. Um, I, I, you know, a lot of folks are not really familiar with these, with these prophecies, um, so um, they may not know that uh, many of the prophecies uh, have very much to do with taking territory in Syria and Iraq. So just like the caliphate um, and its uh, and the centrality of holding territory uh, for the caliphate, um, here also you have a nexus between religion and politics because a lot of these prophecies are about holding certain pieces of territory. Um, uh, and you can say that the Islamic State is appealing to those prophecies cynically, but nevertheless, they're doing so, and it does dictate military strategy uh, to, uh, to some extent. Uh, as to whether you know, every person in the Islamic State uh, is, is very devout in their own conception of, of devotion, uh, certainly not. I mean, there are people there that are just straight-up criminals, 
uh, or or psychopaths, and you have to you have to allow for that. My sense of how the Islamic State thinks of itself and draws recruits is that it's basically the field of dreams uh, uh, speech. If you build it, they will come. If we create this this state. We will gather people in, and they may have different motivations for being here, uh, but the people at the top are the ones dictating uh, the flavor uh, and the face of the organization, uh, which, is, which is very much articulated uh, in, very, um, uh, uh, in very religious, uh, religious terms. Okay. Trudy, did you want to uh, respond? Yeah, I, I mean... Uh, as um, as Will said, it, the the Wood article was a response uh, to the administration, and part of uh, let me use the word silliness. I think I I understand why the administration is reluctant. It's not just political correctness; uh, they want to be able not to defame all Muslims in this country. However, part of the silliness of trying to keep the word Islam out of this debate is that we are seeing and are going to see um, this huge struggle to define the role of Islam in politics in the Middle East going on for some time. Even if ISIS were crushed militarily, which there's no sign uh, that this is going to happen soon, um, you're still going to have this struggle going on. And, and, you know, ironically, uh, this business with the Saudis, it, it only seems to get worse. You, you probably saw a piece uh, about a week ago in the New York Times, Saudi award goes to Muslim televangelist who harshly criticizes U.S. Uh, this is Dr. Um, uh, Zakir Naik, a televangelist from India who has publicly declared that the Jews control America, apostates can be killed, the U.S. is the world's biggest terrorist and September 11th attacks were an inside job by President Bush. Well, he's not the only televangelist. I mean, we know this is a lot of the reason that Saudi Arabia um, has such intense internet and Twitter coverage. You know, if people are talking about televangelism. This goes on all over the region. And Saudi money, as I was mentioning, goes to madrasas in Pakistan, which are training uh, continued generations of jihadi terrorists. And to me, the biggest danger in the world is Pakistan, not ISIS, uh, because Pakistan already has nukes plus terrorists. So, uh, you know, the role of Wahhabi or activist and aggressive Salafi doctrine and the propagation of that at a time when secular politics are, are really in trouble in the region um, and dictators are struggling, e even in Egypt, to maintain a foothold, this is a real issue when it comes to terrorism. And the other thing I think is fascinating that's going on in the Middle East is uh, uh, somebody like General al-Sisi, uh, uh, the president of Egypt, is trying a new approach. We're going to control the mosque. He's trying to emulate Turkey, where clerics are licensed and have to give ba basically the same sermon. He's trying to institutionalize that in Egypt and basically to control al-Azhar. So Islam is in play, and who is going to control doctrine, and what kind of a doctrine is going to emerge. Uh, only a couple of years ago, we were debating whether political Islam would play itself out at the ballot box. But the banning of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, and the crushing of it in Egypt uh, has put paid to that. Only in Tunisia is that still in play, and Tunisia only has 8 million people. So, um, you know, I think there does have to be a lot more thinking about the role of Islam in politics. But this heavily depends on Middle Eastern leadership, which is absent. I guess this is a long way of saying that even if ISIS were to disappear, um, I think radical Islamic doctrines will fuel unrest and terrorism in the region and probably continue to threaten the West for some time to come because there's such a political vacuum. Clint, did you want to respond to that? No, I mean, on the ideological stuff, I think we've hit it, and that's probably, you know, uh, both Trudy and Will are far more versed in that. And, and I think my main points are, 
more with regards to how we're trying to counter this threat. And so, like, if you look at our approach so far, I, I kind of call this, like, 2004 Redux. It's like we've rolled out all these, like, programs that we were doing, either directly or internationally. You know, like, I've heard a lot of hearts and minds start to creep in in certain discussions when we talk about the military fight. And only, you know, if we're going to fight this on religious grounds, we need to do this. I've heard a lot of, like, CVE kind of conversations in the domestic context, even though when you look at, at least from the Americans, uh, perspective, we maybe don't even have the same rate of recruitment to Syria that we did to Somalia, you know, in some ways, when you just look at, at the numbers of people. And there's a few things that I think people should calm down about that ISIS has done. That, you know, it's different, as Will pointed out, on lots of ideological grounds, but in terms of dealing with ISIS, ISIS has done something the U.S. could never do, which is they've rallied most of the Arab countries against them. Like, we, we went, you know, 10 years ago largely into a coalition of the unwilling. And this time, you know, if you look at Jordan, if you look at Saudi and their participation, some of the other Arab countries, they've taken on a more aggressive role in trying to counter ISIS, which has been interesting. Um, the other thing that I think we need to look at is ISIS, we're portraying it on TV as it's Al-Qaeda, you know, next generation or next version, and we need to rally and get excited about it. While I added, you know, some Americans, and I'm sure they would kill any Americans that they could, they're generally not that focused on us. Like, we're not the center of their attention, which for Al-Qaeda, we, by their Al-Qaeda strategy, we were the focus. We were the reason, you know, for all the apostate regimes in the region, the reason all you know, people were being oppressed. And so the way we fight it, we don't necessarily have to so vocally, I think, take the lead and so aggressively say that we're in charge. Now, the converse of that is what you see going on uh, outside of Tikrit right now where the Iranians have essentially taken on uh, and now appear to maybe the Iraqi army for the most part, and we're sitting on the outside. So the decision is kind of like how much do we want to lead and what role do we want to take in Kaizen, which goes back to what are our real concerns with ISIS? Like, why are we that concerned in it? Because if I had to rank our adversaries in the region, uh, Iran, the Syrian Assad regime, uh, Russia, and ISIS, I'm, ISIS is probably my bottom threat that I'm really worried about. And, you know, the ISIS fight is really what's bringing all these sort of forces together. So I, I think some of our hearing, especially in the military, which you're hearing a lot of the, we've got to send the military into the Middle East. We've got to, you know, restore governance. I've seen, you know, some people, especially on the right, talk about deployments. And on the left, you're hearing, you know, sort of the, we can kind of ignore this and mitigate it. Well, you know, I don't really know what we want in the region. It's not clear to me. I would much rather uh, keep Iran at bay than worry about some young boys who uh, are in ISIS territory for the most part. Yeah, and there's a couple of different points, uh, particularly on the foreign fighters issue. So you have like 20,000 or so people that have gone to ISIS uh, to go fight for either ISIS or Jabhat al-Nusra or one of the other groups uh, in Syria. And some of the arguments are that, you know, there's really no, uh, you know, Clint, you've talked before about the foreign fighter flow model and about, you know, hotspots and transit and then... Uh, target locations and then outflow. And there's been a real debate because um, some media accounts recently of foreign fighters in Syria basically said that, no, we're here. We're not going anywhere else. The, the, the caliphate has been reestablished. We're staying here. Um, whereas other people, like the guy who shot up the, uh, the Jewish museum in, in Brussels, uh, Mehdi Namouche, uh, known affectionately as Abu the Hitter uh, from his time in Syria, who was apparently just a psychopath, or sociopath at the least, um, and really kind of got kicked out, and that's why I went back. So some of these CVE measures, it's not quite clear that, you know, denying people passports or, you know, confiscating passports for, so that they cannot go overseas. Um, Clint, I'll just ask you, do you think that there's more of a probability of sort of the, the Ottawa uh, or Quebec attacks uh, by kind of getting really kind of the, the JV team, people that are just kind of more aspirational than capable of going overseas, 
you think that there could be a backlash on that front where they actually could conduct some kind of propaganda of the deed style attacks in the West uh, rather than go overseas? Yeah, I think it's a it's a policy decision. So, you know, some countries are pursuing to interdict them before they go and we'll keep them here. Um, and that even creates a problem of, like, we won't let them get on the plane to Syria, but we also can't really arrest them or we only have a little bit of charges on them, so they're stuck now in our country and they're extremists and they're committed. So we're basically saying, like, either we're going to watch these people, like, forever or we're going to let them go and then ho roll the dice and hope they don't do an attack at home. The other flip side is, you know, you can look at the argument of go to, um, maybe they get interdicted on the battlefield or die. They don't, let's say, they can't come back. Now we got the problem, which was really, they've been. if you remember, Al-Qaeda bin Laden, you know, the reason they went to Sudan is they couldn't camp out in Saudi and a lot of these other countries where they originally came from. So then you have a pooling problem, which is they're going to go to wherever they can uh, in order to, you know, pursue their violence. And, and that causes regional, you know, violence and regional issues. And then that's that blowback issue of, you know, will we see those external plots start being generated? So you're picking one of two strategies. Do we keep the lid on the pressure cooker at home, or do we send them off and just interdict them, you know, through military means and then hope we don't have blowback? I don't think anyone's thought through, you know, either approach. In both of these scenarios, though, the real concern should be for Europe. I mean, they've got a problem both ways, and the countries are picking a mix of policies, yet they're the European Union. So travel is, you know, relatively easy between one and the other, you know, once you get in. So which strategy is the best? I kind of uh, am of the opinion that you let them go. If they really want to go to Syria and find out how great the uh, caliphate is, especially when it's starting to decline, I think it will decline over the next two to three years, maybe that's the best way to go and let them either lose faith in what they're doing or get interdicted, you know, on the battlefield, rather than cooping them up and sort of, you know, keeping them in place here in the West, only to do what, you know, if we can't really try or prosecute them, uh, we don't really have any evidence against them. Then, then how are we going to handle it moving forward? Will, did you want to? Right say now, anything? we have a mismatch of strategies. I guess is what I'm saying. Ah. Will, did you want to respond to anything there? Um. No, I mean, I, I guess my preference would be uh, a little bit different than Clint's. Would would be more, um, you know, trying to to keep them at home, not letting them go abroad. I certainly understand the attractiveness of letting them go abroad, but I also know just looking at the history of, say, Egypt. You know, whenever they let their, you know, their the folks that aspired to fight go abroad, you had some percentage of them inevitably come back home with with great skills um, and I guess my preference would be that they don't have a chance to go abroad and get those skills but you know I don't I also agree with Clint that it's one policy is not obviously better than the other I mean there is a there is a big trade-off for both of them Trudy did you want to say maybe anything? the answer is oh, I'm sorry well, no I actually uh, wanted to refer to things that Quint has written because he's done so much work on this. I find it astonishing that we are both so ha hapless and ham-handed in trying to create any kind of a social media strategy and simply seem incapable of trying to counter uh, the attractive recruitment um, strategies of, of ISIS. And, you know, I'm curious to ask uh, Quint if he thinks it's even possible for the U.S. to get better at this. Um, I think it's possible. I think it, it largely won't happen because people mostly don't want to, and we have an unwieldy bureaucracy where no one's really, like, the single entity in charge, you know, of taking that on. We should definitely not let Will off the hook because he's been intimately involved with in that okay. uh, over, over the longer term. But our, our approach is way too convoluted. It's far too slow. We will probably roll out our ISIS CVE online strategy right about the time ISIS is almost defunct. I think that'll be the natural <laughs> time when the program is rolled out. 
It'll probably be like right about the time Boko Haram is the biggest thing, and then we'll roll out an ISIS strategy and sometime in like 2018. Um, our content will be put together very slowly. Uh, in social media, it needs to be rapid and quick and engaging. It'll mostly be designed for old government people to be happy with it, which will make it incredibly lame. It would be like your parents' you know, television shows from the 80s, you know, like how you're just going to about it. So it won't be effective at all uh, with the recruits. It'll be so uh, lacking in multimedia and so lackluster in, in its engagement that you almost won't be able to watch it. You'll need something that's two to three minutes long. We'll produce something that's two to three hours long. Um... Yeah, it, it generally our process supports safety and uh, not having risk-taking to the point where we can't possibly be engaging or timely. And so, uh, and, uh, and this goes to the media too, Trudy, you're in this group. You will not let us uh, have any wiggle room on trying to figure out success and failure. So I, I can see why the government people are the way they are. As yeah. soon as they try something, before it comes out the door, everybody in government that doesn't like it will leak to the media that this program is crap and that it should be shut down, and then the media will pounce on it before they can even, you know, begin experimenting. The truth of it is, like ISIS, they'll put out thousands of videos, and like 900 of them will suck, and about 100 of them will be effective, and they have this advantage where they can make mistakes and try things and keep putting out videos and, you know, evolving. Whenever we try to put a, together a CV program, especially in social media, in the U.S., there are 900 people's fingers in the pot, and everybody is trying to stir it in a different direction, and whoever doesn't get their way internally kills it, and externally the media kills it, and by the time it gets out, it's like the movie Geely, you know, that one with Ben Affleck. And, you know, the <laughs> like, like, no one ever watched it. It's miserable. And so... <laughs> Our process just isn't conducive to it. You could do the equivalent of, you know, that's kind of what I put in my article. You could do the equivalent of what ISIS does for a fraction of the cost, you know, in terms of our counter narrative. You could put it together with creative people using credit cards. I mean, I could do it at my house. I've even been tempted to do this until I realize, like, it's totally not in my best interest or in my job. And so, like, all you got to do, the stories are right there. We've got, you know, Women and children being ke killed by ISIS. You've got Arar al Sham and Nusra guys. You've got clerics that are being killed as spies. You've got ISIS now failing to achieve their objectives. You've got corruption in Syria and heavy handed violence against the locals. I mean, you don't even have to write the scripts. We've got defectors that are streaming out. There was an article before. And then probably there's some 2005 lame production of Democracy is Great. And then talk to them about uh, your religion, you don't got it right, you know, your re religion's really like this, and no one will watch it. And we'll forget about it until the next flare up. So, I mean, that's kind of what I think will happen. And it's not necessarily any person's fault, but the way our system works really brings it to a complete fault, just complete halt. So, there's my very optimistic assessment of like, and how we're going to go on, on CBE. Yeah, and there are people trying to do good things. I know there's some brilliant people in the U.S. government, so I'm not trying to bash them, but the rest of the organization will get right in front of them and try and stop them from moving forward. That's for sure. Trudy, did you want to respond to any of them? No, I wanted to hear what Will had to say. <laughs> well, yeah, you should ask Will. Will should be talking about this. Yeah, this is, where I, this is where I go for my bathroom break, Mike, if that's <laughs> That's right. Uh, should out oh. Will. You know, Clint, Clint knows that I've, I've seen this stuff from the inside. When I was at State Department, I helped set up um, the Center for Strategic Counterterrorism Communications, part of which does this online pushback. And when we set it up, it was envisioned as a political war room uh, that would message constantly um, uh, against, uh, against al-Qaeda. Um, but as Clint said, for all the reasons that Clint said, um, it's, it's had a very difficult time uh, doing what it needs to do. In its early days, actually, uh, it did much better because it only had to tweet, uh, not even tweet, it only had to post uh, in Arabic. 
And so there was, because nobody at the State Department knew Arabic, nobody could really, um, uh, uh, you know, watch uh, closely what they were doing. You had oversight, but it was more confined to the organization. So it was, a, it was they had a much freer hand um, in experimenting, as Clint says. And without the latitude to experiment, uh, an organization like this cannot cannot succeed um, uh, in any sector, much less in the government. Um, and, a, and a friend of mine once said to me, uh, who was connected with this effort, you know, I never want to do this in English because the minute we start doing it in English, the eye of Sauron will turn on us. Um, and that's exactly right. The minute you start doing it in English, everybody at stake can all of a sudden read it. And everybody in the media, the Western media, could start reading it. And, uh, of course, everybody would become hypercritical, which then has a, a, a negative reinforcing effect because um, the folks uh, that, are, that are trying to put these messages out start to become even more cautious. Uh, so by the end of it, they're, they're, they're tweeting and writing the most inane things possible because, as Clint says, you have so many people... Uh, that are interfering, and now the effort is basically being shut down. I mean, that office is being reorganized. Um, the new effort will be more on empowering uh, third-party voices, uh, which basically means just you know uh, uh, making sure that that statements by Muslims against ISIS will be heard, or 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 uh, defectors will be heard, that sort of stuff. And you know that that might be okay, but. It's sad to me to see it uh, go that way, um, uh, and for the United States not being uh, um, uh, able to articulate its message, because regardless of what, what you think of whether uh, that it was effective or not, um, it was important that the U.S. government be out there articulating its position. I mean, we were scared of our own shadow when I first started at the at State Department in 2009, and it took a lot to get the government to even decide that, you know, we, you know, we, had, uh, we had something we wanted to say. And if people didn't like it, that's fine. But at least the U.S. government should be out there defending its own actions. Um, and that's gone away. And now we're scared of our own shadow again. We want other people to, to say things for us. Um, and, you know, a lot of the content that organization produced, I didn't particularly care for it. But I also understood that experimentation was extremely valuable. And we will never get good at this kind of messaging if people in government are not allowed to take those risks. But it's, it's done. The, the fact that when that organization started to write in English meant that any room for experimentation um, was over. And the you know, the, the, the irony of all of this is there are no reliable metrics to know whether you're doing it well or not. So it, it, the success of the effort almost completely relies on uh, the perception of, of media and the perception of the higher-ups in government, who, by the way, respond almost exclusively to negative media. So the more negative the media was, the more those folks in the higher positions uh, would start raining down hurt uh, on the organization, so um, I, I think I think the effort is is done, and I don't see how it is going to be revived. And it's it's too bad because it, it took some doing uh, to uh, to try and and uh, and set it up. And again, I'm not and like Clint, I'm not trying really to assign blame to any particular person, but just noting that this is this is how our our system works. And given that this is the way it works, it's it's probably useless to um, to uh, advocate for trying it again and one would hope that you know uh, more uh, uh, private organizations would undertake this sort of thing but I have to say the whole reason why the government got into this business to begin with <laughs> is because it did not see anybody out there that was doing this stuff consistently I mean there is a real paucity of people who are um, taking the ISIS model but turning it against them uh, it's it's just not happening uh, even now. Well, I promise you guys an hour. Uh, so if Trudy and Clint want to take about thirty seconds each to respond, and then we'll wrap things up. Um, I think the best hope uh, for combating ISIS is that it is going to self-destruct from within, as as we have touched on in the discussion, um, because. Uh, 
the the complex rivalries in the Middle East uh, within Iraq within Syria I think are going to make it very difficult um, uh, to simply destroy it from without and and uh, um, you know I, I was talking to somebody uh, in Baghdad just yesterday and and <coughs> he was expressing that hope uh, but uh, it doesn't look like the US has a strategy either in fighting back on Twitter or um, on uh, figuring out how to play uh, a, um, an impressive and, and relevant role in, in really pushing back ISIS. Um, you know, and as far as religion, again, I think that's a battle that's going to have to be played out within the Middle East. Uh, the role of Islam, political Islam, and which ideology trumps. Clint? Yeah, on the social media thing, I guess what I should say is all we're doing is making like uh, Vienna Twitter sausages now. Like, uh, it, you don't know how it's made. There's a whole bunch of people involved. It doesn't taste like anything. It has no effect. And I don't see, I've seen a ton of talk again about how we got to fight them online. I don't see how we're going to do it until someone can can like we'll talk about just stand up and say, "Hey, w w this is not going to work at times. You know, we will fail and we will move forward." Which I don't know who in government is going to do that. In terms of ISIS, I've always been a fan of the let them rot strategy. What I'm worried about the containment strategy, contain ISIS, let them fail. You know, cut off the resources is you're seeing the evolution of a sectarian war and that that will be what spirals out even if we do let it rot correctly. Like even if we extract ourselves from the conflict, the way uh, the IRGC is involved from Iran, the way Shiite militias are involved now from southern Iraq, uh, the Kurds, you know, on the other side, I think any way we cut it, we're in this sort of <coughs> reinforcing the the sectarian conflict of Sunni and Shia in the region. So I, I don't know any good options, but it's interesting how no one's put forth an alternative on governance, which is really what has to happen to sort of settle both the Syrian civil war and restore Iraq. And I would love to hear somebody bring up the three-state solution in Iraq again, because it's pretty much already happening, you know, one way or another. Yeah, the trouble is nobody can make it happen officially and peacefully so uh, it it the fighting keeps on going. Right. Will any last words? Um, just to agree with 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 Trudy that you know the the question of whether the Islamic State is is uh, a legitimate form of Islam or not is is one that only Muslims uh, can answer. Um, I think it's important to understand the ways that the organization religiously. Um, uh, uh, thinks of itself and seeks to justify its actions, but in terms of the United States responding to um, the religious dimensions of the Islamic State, again, that's something that's best left for Muslims to sort out. We we have other other things that we can do uh, to uh, to discredit its efforts. Primarily, as both uh, Trudy and Clint say, um, making sure that the the organization. Uh, um, uh, loses its hold on territory. I, I disagree s slightly with, with Clint. I think the let them rot strategy is what got us into this situation and the United States has to be much more out front um, in making sure that um, uh, uh, we roll back the organization militarily. That's going to require working with somebody on the ground in, in Syria and our Options there are, are, are vanishingly small and growing smaller. Our effort to date is, uh, is uh, too meager uh, to bear up to the challenge. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we're going to have to end on a down note there. And we didn't even get into uh, the Houthi issue uh, with, with, uh, with Iran kind of supporting uh, that group in Yemen. Uh, we didn't get to, I wanted to bring up Barack Mendelssohn's piece in Foreign Affairs this week as well, which is uh, controversial in and of itself. Uh, about uh, kind of letting pressure off of Al Qaeda a bit uh, in order to counter ISIS right now. Uh, but I want to thank each of you for participating today. Will McCants, Trudy Rubin, Clint Watts. Uh, this broadcast will be on the FPRI YouTube page. 
uh, and it's been brought to you by uh, FPRI's program on national security and our program on the Middle East. So thank you for joining us, and uh, we'll see you again in the future. Thanks for uh, taking part in our our first uh, foray into uh, into this venue. Thank you very much. Pleasure.